Hi, I'm Mary Ann Davis. I'm the director of the Transitions RTC. And today we're going to be talking about the needs and supports for pursuing post-secondary education and training for youth with psychiatric disabilities. This webcast series represents a collaboration between VCU CTI and UMass Medical School's Transitions RTC. The work that is uh, represented in this presentation is uh, developed under grant funding from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, the views, however, uh, represented in this presentation uh, do not necessarily represent the views of our federal funders. So the Transitions Research and Training Center uh, houses the learning and working during the Transition to Adulthood Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. And we are part of the University of Massachusetts Medical School's Department of Psychiatry, and we're housed within the Systems and Psychosocial Advances Research Center. Uh, you can get more of our information at our website, which is listed at the bottom of this slide. So first we'll talk about what we mean by serious mental health conditions or psychiatric disability. Uh, in this presentation, I'll primarily use the term serious mental health conditions, and it refers to um, any of the conditions that are typically referred to as serious emotional disturbance, serious mental illness, or psychiatric disability. And these are all terms that represent the presence of a mental health diagnosis that causes substantial functional impairment in a variety of areas. Um, some examples of those mental health diagnoses include major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder, uh, anorexia nervosa, uh, impulse control and conduct disorders are also part of those mental health disorders. Um, however, it does not represent um, these disorders listed here, although these can co-occur with a mental health diagnosis. Neurodevelopmental disorders, primarily intellectual disabilities, autism or learning dis disorders. Uh, or neurocognitive disorders, a traumatic brain injury or delirium. It also doesn't represent substance abuse disorders or substance use disorders. Although, as I said, these can co-occur with a mental health condition. So I wanted to start off by making folks familiar with a recent study that was completed by the Institute of Medicine that focused on the health and well-being of young adults in our country. Uh, the findings of that uh, study and the report that produced a summary of those uh, findings and recommendations can be found at the Institute of Medicine's website that is on the top of your page. For the purposes of this presentation, one of the key findings of, of that study was that the world has really changed in ways that place greater demands on young adults now. That there's been an economic restructuring, advances in information and communication technologies, and changes in the labor market that have really altered radically the landscape of risk and opportunity during young adulthood. And in particular, uh, along the lines of risk, is that this is a time of life in which the inequalities that we see between those who have more or less income during adulthood can really be magnified at this time of life, or the magnification can result from differences between opportunities or actions at this stage of life. We know that among 16 to 24-year-olds, that 17% uh, of that population is neither working nor going to school. And that is uh, of great concern um, because in recent years, uh, even before the Great Recession, that there's been an increasing earnings gap between those who earn a four-year college degree and those who earn a high school diploma. Uh, that has roughly doubled since 1980 and is even greater for those who don't complete a high school diploma. So this stage of life uh, during which uh, most young people would pursue some post-secondary education or training, that could be vocational training, um, is incredibly important uh, and very important for those who have a serious mental health condition. Uh, many of the findings that I'll be talking about uh, today in this presentation are summarized in a publication from, from our uh, Learning and Working Transitions Rehabilitation Research and Training Center that can be found at this website. Uh, we held a State of the Science conference in the fall of 2013, and at that point summarized the uh, state of the research in both uh, educational supports and employment for that meeting. And those summaries can be found in this document uh, that can be found at this uh, web link. 
So the importance of education, um, as I had said, uh, is increasingly um, central uh, for all youth and young adults in terms of their income employment. Uh, and that is primarily what the Institute of Medicine looked at for its evidence of its importance. But education benefits young people and society in a variety of other ways as well, which is important to keep in mind. Uh, we have uh, funded public education because it provides a better informed citizenry. Uh, so not only can we uh, be qualified for uh, good jobs, but for voting and policy making, we can be better informed citizens. Um, we also know that education produces, actually produces, better physical health. Um, it re reduces emotional stress, or those who have higher levels of education have reduced emotional distress. And there's reduced crime among those who have higher education. And there's some evidence that producing higher education levels actually reduces crime. So these are all important benefits of education. However, we see that youth who have a serious mental health condition have compromised educational attainment. This begins at the level of post-secondary education, which I will review briefly because we'll focus primarily on post-secondary -educa post education and training. However, it's very hard to go on to post-secondary education and training when you haven't completed your high school uh, education. Um, and for this particular population, we have great concerns about that because special education students with emotional disturbance have the highest rate of high school incompletion. It is a 44% rate of high school incompletion compared to 14 to 29% of those in other disability categories. This group also has the lowest rate of school performance during high school, lowest attendance, lowest grades, low, uh, highest rates of grade retention uh, compared to other disability groups. These findings come from the National Longitudinal Transition Study, the second version of that. Uh, so these are relatively recent findings. Also of tremendous importance as we think about how we reach out to young people before they can potentially um, access post-secondary education is that the majority of young people who have a serious mental health condition are not served in special education settings. Only about 11% of high school students with a serious mental health condition are actually receiving special education services. Uh, this is very important for trying to target well our programs and outreach for this population. We also know that youth with serious mental health conditions have over six times the risk of high school dropout of those students without a serious mental health condition. And that the proportion of failure to complete secondary education that is attributable to mental health conditions is 46%. This is an extremely high uh, contribution to school dropout and school incompletion. Um, this was the result of Ann van der Stoop and her colleagues' research um, published in 2003. There are uh, developing interventions to help students with serious mental health conditions successfully complete high school. Foremost among those is the Check and Connect program that has some good uh, preliminary evidence in a small randomized control trial uh, that showed better completion, high school completion rate among those who were in the Check and Connect program. And Check and Connect is currently um, undergoing a larger clinical trial that um, will have uh, uh, more rigorous research findings. The Check and Connect program um, primarily pairs students with mentors who are available to them at their schools. That, those mentors are a cross between a mentor, somebody who advocates for them, and somebody else who helps to coordinate their services. The mentor works with the student and their family for two years wherever a student is, um, as long as they remain in that basic school district. So a mentor will follow a young person if they, they are moved or they move to a different school within that district. The mentor monitors the student's attendance, their grades, and any problems on them. So that's the check part of the connect. And then the connecting part is that they talk to students about their progress, about their relationship, um, about the relationship between school completion um, and those check indicators of engagement. They talk about the importance of staying in school. Uh, they talk about problem solving steps to use to resolve conflict and to cope with life's challenges. So helping a young person develop a lot of skills during high school that will not only help them complete high school, stay in high school and complete it, but also to have success later in life and those mentors stay in close communication with families. You can find out more about the Check and Connect program at this uh, website listed at the bottom of your slide. 
but moving on to post-secondary education and training. We've seen a sharp increase in the number of college students who have a serious mental health condition. There are current estimates that about 9 to 18 percent of college students have mild to significant mental health issues. These are all uh, relatively recent findings that are, have been confirmed by um, a variety of uh, sources that regularly um, uh, record um, various reports from colleges. We see an increasing number of students that seek help for mental health issues on campus as well, and that there are concerning rates of suicide ideation, um, currently estimated to be around 11% of college students that have suicidal ideation, and there has been um, very concerning rates of uh, suicide attempts and completion uh, among college students. And so there has really been an increasing focus on what is broadly referred to as college mental health that reflects uh, both the increasing presence of students on campus who have a mild, moderate, or serious mental health condition, uh, increasing demands on uh, resources that colleges may provide or refer students to for addressing those mental health needs, um, and of course uh, the, the very concerning um, occurrence of suicide uh, attempts or uh, completions on campus that has really increased interest on college campuses. Our focus is really on the success of college students when they are um, attending college and they have a serious mental health condition. We find that those with uh, serious mental health conditions that do go on to college, and as we saw in previous slide, the majority of students with serious mental health conditions actually don't go on to college. But for those who do, um, they have higher rates of part-time student status than among students who don't have a serious mental health condition. They have higher dropout rates from college and a lower graduation rate. So there's a lot to be done to help young people who are attending college to help them succeed at college, stay, and graduate. Within former special education students, those who have a serious mental health condition are the least likely of all students with disabilities to report that disability to college disability services. We see that 21% uh, do not report their disability services um, versus only 3 to 15% in other disability categories. These are among students who receive special education services in high school and that there's a broad perception out there that student disability offices don't know how to help students who have serious mental health conditions among those students who have those conditions. So students who, are, who have a serious mental health condition are not seeking what we would think of as a good resource for helping them succeed academically on college campuses. Investigators at our Transitions RTC were interested in understanding the experiences of current students who are on campuses who have a serious mental health condition. Catherine Sabella, Amanda Costa, and Tanya Duproy worked with Mark Saltzer from Temple University to analyze uh, data that his, he and his colleagues had collected and published in 2012, which was a survey of both current and former uh, college students who had serious mental health conditions. That survey uh, had a sample of 520 individuals who represented 357 different colleges and universities. This was a participatory action research uh, project in which young people with lived experience with mental health conditions uh, helped to uh, determine what was the important research question of interest, designed the research study, conducted the study, um, and are in the process of developing the findings for publication. Um, they determined that the important question that they wanted to address was really what are the experiences of current young adults on campuses, uh, and how might they differ or be similar to older adults who are current students, students on college campuses uh, to get a sense of what might be better supports for those young adult college students. So the current students uh, who are under age 25, there were 73 in this sample, and there were 68 who were 25 and older. Uh, the analyses that this group conducted generally compared the younger adults to the older adults who were current college students. So they found some different circumstances between younger and older adults. They found that 48% of the younger adults lived on campus 
and that in this sample of older adults, none of them were living on campus. This has important uh, implications for where one can reach out to young adults with serious mental health conditions on campus, indicating that maybe residential life or residential settings might be an important location for outreach, uh, which would not be a, a, a good candidate possibly for older students. They also found that there was a slightly different array of self-reported diagnoses. They found that there was more depression and other types of diagnoses reported in young adults compared to more psych psychotic disorder and anxiety in older dis adults. However, they found that there were basically similar gender and racial distributions, a similar distribution of full and part-time status, uh, the grades that people reported for themselves, and the percent that were on psychiatric medication. So there were also very important similarities between young adults and older adults uh, attending college. <clears throat> So then they looked at their experiences and they found that there was a significantly different um, reporting of the use of disability services between younger and older adults. Essentially, younger adults on campus were much less likely than older adults to report that they had used disability services. Overall, the rate of using disability services also was not the majority, um, as would be clear from these data, uh, but young adults were even less likely to use them. Um, and while young adults were, were less aware of accommodations or requested fewer accommodations, um, these were not significant differences. So for those who had requested accommodation at disability services offices, um, these investigators looked at differences between younger and older adults and found that two areas had significant differences that defining or deciding what were reasonable or appropriate accommodations uh, were a difficulty, were more of a difficulty in young adults than in older adults. Um, we don't have the exact reason why they found this to be more difficult. However, uh, we may find that they are less informed about what may be reasonable accommodations um, on college campuses. Uh, and if these young people had recently been recipients of special education services, as we'll discuss later, uh, accommodations are, are requested and accessed in different ways on college campuses than they are in high school. These students also had a, a more frequent uh, report of feeling inferior to other students, uh, with more than 60% of them reporting that feeling. Uh, compared to about 30% of older adults, um, which may refer to a greater feeling of stigma or uh, a greater um, importance of peers in younger adults than we see in older adults. There were other different experiences that were important as well. We found that younger students were more likely to use the campus facilities, like to use the gym or the student center. Again, these have important implications for where one might reach out to young adult college students. They also reported poorer relationships with the college administrative personnel than older um, students, and they reported greater dissatisfaction. Again, maybe because college uh, is uh, typical for young adults, um, they might have had greater expectations of what their experiences would be on a college campus, um, and that may have contributed to their uh, greater dissatisfaction when they faced uh, challenges and uh, since they didn't tend to access disability services, offices may have found greater challenges and less help. As I mentioned earlier, that there's an important shift in the federal laws that cover um, access to accommodations in schools. Um, when young people are in, post, are in secondary education, uh, their rights are covered by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, known as IDEA or IDEA. Um, and that shifts to the uh, rights um, and laws covered by the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and uh, these are considerably different from one another. Uh, special education services are based on IDEA. Schools are required to identify the education needs of students with disabilities, and they're required to provide a free and appropriate education. So the onus is on schools to both identify and figure out what is needed to prov provide students who have disabilities a free and appropriate education. The Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act um, are what covers the rights that students have when they're in college. 
these acts uh, prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability as long as that person is otherwise qualified to attend college. You don't have to be qualified to attend high school. And so the IDEA covers all students, where um, the ADA in Section 504 covers students who are otherwise qualified to attend college. And this is for public colleges and universities or private non-sectarian. Um, but it does not guarantee your access to these schools. Colleges and universities must make reasonable accommodations so a student may be able to demonstrate their ability to be at the school. But there are other ways in which this, uh, these two um, sets of legislation put different demands on students when they enter college. So um, for in colleges, generally there are a few colleges in which uh, the disability services offices will provide you a plan. Uh, an individualized education plan is at the core of special education services, known as the IEP. Um, the colleges don't need to make these for college students. Um, usually, any plan that, that occurs identifies the accommodations uh, that are needed uh, without putting them in the context of what a student's goals are or how are they progressing. They're uh, primarily uh, what is a student's need essentially on an uh, ongoing basis. The student at college is responsible for identifying him or herself to the disability office. They are res responsible for requesting accommodation and for providing the documentation so to, that supports their need for accommodations. So the onus is on the student in college um, and on their families helping them to achieve this. Um, one of the major differences then is that you have to have documentation um, that you have uh, a disability that qualifies you under uh, the Rehabilitation Act or under the ADA. And having had an IEP or a 504 plan in high school is not qualifying documentation. Students have to have, to have a different documentation. And it's important to check with the Disability Services Office of that campus to determine what it is that they need for appropriate documentation. So there's a big difference from, from high school to college. And one of the major um, barriers then is a lack of knowledge about the process for requesting disability services um, at college and also the stigma that in many ways uniquely attends the having a serious mental health condition that can prohibit a young person from making themselves known to the disability services office. And as we saw in the prior research, uh, a common belief that disability services won't know what it is that they need to succeed at school would also be a disincentive to requesting those services. So a student is responsible for requesting and setting up every request. For example, for testing accommodations, um, a student has to provide the appropriate office with the dates and times of the exams. Um, so it's not even once it is in, in some sort of a plan that these are the kinds of accommodations. It's then up to the student to be sure that whatever they need to, to access those accommodations are known to the people who can provide it. Um, the instructors are also not required to alter the content or the goals or the types of tests in their course. Um, so these are very important qualifications to understand. Some of the other important considerations about college campuses um, that can provide um, particular barriers for students with serious mental health conditions include some barriers of policy that uh, campuses have instituted, typically not specifically targeted at students who have serious mental health conditions, but often differentially impacts them. For example, um, well, this one is uh, focused more on that population. Many campuses um, require uh, some absence after any kind of self-injury or suicide attempt that they uh, essentially enforce the student leave campus um, for some period of time and then be able to document that they are ready to return. Um, sometimes they will retract student financial aid due to mental health issues. Um, there can be highly restrictive or punitive, punitive policies for withdrawing um, from a class. Uh, so one of the things that um, is helpful to many students is to be able to uh, withdraw from a class um, when they are experiencing serious mental health um, symptoms uh, under periods potentially of high stress. 
uh, to be able to withdraw without um, uh, having to uh, have any kind of uh, consequence of that would be a, a very helpful policy. Um, there's also discriminatory, discriminatory application of medical leave policies that allow campuses to really uh, put very serious barriers to the return of students who have mental health conditions. And sometimes they're very arbitrary return policies after illness. Um, you can see summaries of some of these policies and some remedies for them at the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law website um, in their report from 2008. Um, the Bazelon Center and others have also um, tried to develop uh, blueprints for policy revisions. Um, they have developed uh, sample policies that uh, are like leave of absence protocols or um, policies for self-harm other than a zero tolerance policy, um, policies that individualize the re-entry requirements so that they are more accommodating to students who can succeed at, 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 camp, at college, and co protocols that encourage campus-wide multi-departmental communication about a student in distress to provide a, a greater safety net. Um, these types of policies and practices are likely to lead to greater success of students who have mental health conditions who are uh, pursuing college. Um, some schools now are looking to develop emergency contact notification protocols where students are encouraged to sign releases of information in advance that will allow a notification under very specific circumstances so that the college can help get them the, the help that they need. Um, and then uh, some colleges are also uh, negotiating uh, memoranda of understanding with local hospitals for students who have psychiatric crises to be sure that they have rapid access to those types of services. One of the important changes from high school to college is, is also sort of the nature of the um, environment. Um, the, the college community is made up of a variety of different offices and services that are centrally important to students who have serious mental health conditions. So there is the Disability Services Office. Uh, they typically have a very small number of staff, and uh, the staff have very large student caseloads often. And typically, they are less informed about what might be reasonable accommodations for students with mental health conditions. Um, this varies across lots of different college campuses, but it is more typical for them to feel less informed about what are reasonable accommodations for students who have mental health conditions than for uh, typically learning, uh, learning types of disorders or for intellectual disabilities types of conditions. The counseling centers are often um, present on campus. Many, many campuses have college counseling centers, but they really are for, uh, typically for brief treatment. Um, and for students who have more serious or ongoing needs or for who need uh, medications or uh, to be prescribed, uh, typically they would be referred out from a college counseling center. The campus police can play an important role um, on campuses related to students who have mental health needs because they may not have training in how to um, recognize the signs of uh, a mental health condition versus other causes of behavior that are problematic. And they may treat a student uh, who is uh, uh, experiencing acute symptoms as somebody who is willfully um, uh, having a problem behavior rather than somebody who may need uh, emergency help or connection to services. And finally, residential life is a really important consideration for uh, uh, places where um, students who have serious mental health conditions could receive supportive help. Um, resident uh, RAs often know what's going on in young people's lives uh, at a level because they're away from uh, the classroom and they can see um, relationships and ongoing issues. Uh, they often know what students are experiencing and so they could be a wealth of information helping to support students as well as uh, basically uh, being able to identify when a young person is starting to have some significant needs. There have been a variety of um, efforts to support mentally healthy campuses. The Jed Foundation um, has uh, particularly focused on uh, suicide prevention, but uh, also in so doing just uh, generally um, providing supports for campuses to um, uh, provide for just generally better mentally healthy campus. Um, Active Minds on Campus also has been very active in trying to um, help 
uh, campus-wide efforts. So improving communication to students and parents about mental health conditions and symptoms and signs and what campus supports are available is very important. Um, these uh, organizations also have uh, trainings and educations for the college community so that uh, people, uh, faculty and counseling centers and disability services and residential life um, have a better sense of what it means to have a mental health condition um, and what are the kinds of supports and services that can help students uh, with those conditions both have the best mental health they possibly can but also be academically successful. Um, and there are broad campaigns now to destigmatize mental illness because the stigma of mental illness um, both affects young people and their perceptions of themselves, uh, contributes to great misperceptions on the parts of others about uh, what it means for a young person to have a mental health condition and, and what they uh, might contribute to the college campus. Um, and so there are wide uh, campaigns underway at this point. For the remainder of this presentation, we're going to talk about specific uh, approaches to helping students uh, be more successful uh, at college or completing their college when they have a serious mental health condition. Um, right now, there are currently uh, no single approach with a strong evidence of success. Um, there have been a variety of reviews looking at what we might refer to as supported education approaches. Uh, largely, these have been approaches that are offered through vocational rehabilitation services or through mental health services, primarily targeted at mature adults who have uh, psychiatric disabilities who are wanting to um, uh, either attend college or get some college credits or some other post-secondary types of training. And none of these approaches um, have essentially they have not undergone rigorous research that would allow us to test and determine uh, their effectiveness. So right now there is no single approach that one could give a stamp of having uh, achieved the status of evidence-based practice for adults with psychiatric disabilities and helping them um, succeed in post-secondary education. Partly because of this, um, uh, Michelle Mullen, who is at Rutgers University, um, and colleagues of ours at the Transitions RTC um, collaborated together to try to develop uh, a college-based, potentially a college-based uh, intervention or to develop a, an intervention for young adult college students with mental health conditions. And part of that effort was to really do a rigorous environmental scan that included an analysis of nominated innovative programs. These are programs that a wide variety of indiv individuals suggested were both innovative in their approach to helping young adults with serious mental health conditions succeed in college um, and in post-secondary uh, training settings um, that people also broadly felt were uh, had some evidence um, that suggested that they were successful. And so uh, Marsha Ellison with Sloan Huckabee, Rachel Stone, and Michelle Mullen um, have interviewed 29 of these programs um, and uh, looked for what were some of the common factors across them that may help inform uh, a strong uh, program that could be tested for its uh, evidence of efficacy. Um, so all of them had young adult-focused planning. Uh, the plan development had a functional orientation rather than how can we get your mental health treated, more of what is it that we can do to help you achieve your goals, whether that's a goal to um, attend more class classes or to be more connected with uh, the students on campus, um, that they had that type of functional orientation rather than a treatment type of orientation. Um, they all uh, treated the person as a, a person who had a diagnosis, but primarily was a person um, who had a wide variety of needs, as any individuals would have a wide variety of needs. They were all very client-centered. They were individualized. The, uh, they were driven by the goals of the individual and by their desires. Um, and they were strengths-based. They really tried to build on the strengths that the individuals um, brought to the situation in order to address the challenges that they were facing. Um, many of them uh, helped young people make decisions about whether or not or how to and under what circumstances to disclose their mental health condition. Um, and they often helped with financial aid planning. And you can see here a quote from uh, an individual 
uh, provider in one of these programs. Um, it seemed to me to be much more focused on teaching someone to be su a successful adult rather than how do you sort of cope with having a system of care for you your whole life. I like the emphasis on self-determination and teaching in this approach. These programs also focused on participation and communication. They were very much about youth voice and youth empowerment, trying to help young people um, feel that what they have to say and their perspectives on the world and how things should be, including their own uh, services and care, uh, is very important. Um, they had uh, participants uh, really involved in the programs often themselves, um, and it was very important to have uh, communication, very strong communication. Um, and make that relevant for young people. And as, all, as we all know, that uh, the ways that young people tend to communicate with one another and, and with others is different from how older people communicate. Um, and one person in a program, uh, a provider, said, you can call them all day long and not get a response, but if you text, they get right back to you. They don't like getting on the phone to talk. Uh, the communication also sometimes looked like anything, anywhere, anytime. Uh, essentially, that's what texting allows. Um, and so uh, this is a very different way of communicating. Uh, it's not a nine to five, I will call you on the phone. It's much more about being reachable and reaching out. Family involvement is part of these programs that they all, uh, that many of them provide some psychoeducation uh, that help families learn about mental illness and about illness management so they can support their young adult child in doing so. Um, a lot of them help families understand the benefits that young people are uh, uh, um, eligible for. Uh, these could include social security benefits, but also uh, health care coverage um, and how that might change as a young person um, ages, what they might be eligible for as they reach different age thresholds or different circumstances. Um, one quote uh, from a provider, I would really emphasize again that you have to work with families. There's no way to do this without working with families. Um, and so it's an important caveat to keep in mind. While youth voice is incredibly important and should be in the forefront, the work with families is also beneficial. Many of them talked about how important it was to help young adults develop their skills, their skills in a wide variety of areas which correspond um, highly with what we think are are of the skills that adults will need in their lives, employment skills, structured work experience um, to help them with their employment skills, uh, to pro provide a variety of support services and skills for, for accessing them, uh, general life skills. Um, they provide education and training development, um, psychoeducation to help people understand their illness and how they can manage it, manage it best, and skills for social aspects of, of attending school. Now, the focus of these various programs um, varied a bit. Some of them provided um, primarily educational and vocational supports. Um, we found primarily that uh, if they were focusing on education, that they were also uh, providing some vocational supports, and that because so many college students are who have a serious mental health condition are part-time students, many of them are also trying to balance um, working while they're uh, going to school. Um, so that combined education and vocational support is very important. Um, a lot of them are helping young people uh, finish their high school uh, education or get their GED, um, help them access post-secondary vocational training, um, and help uh, with staying in their training or, or post-secondary education. Um, some of them are focused on early intervention and prevention for early signs of psychosis. Those programs are percolating up more broadly across the U.S. now. Um, many of them have social goals that they help young people identify and pursue, um, particularly important since this is such a social time of life. Um, they often will also focus on independent living supports for housing, transportation, food, nutrition, and laundry. It's very hard to pursue your education or employment goals when those needs are not met. Um, and finally, some of them will describe that their, um, their uh, focus includes recovery um, and community integration. Essentially, as one person said, pursuing a quality of life goal outside of their mental health status is very important. 
as we have talked about um, in the previous webinar, the uh, ability to help young people engage and stay in services is very important, and they are at particular risk of not staying engaged even when they have started to uh, become involved in a program. So these programs all recognize the risk of, of losing contact with somebody when you've started to help them, and so they provide a very strong focus on building relationships um, and to provide for service flexibility when somebody doesn't show up or when there's a gap in their service. Um, as various people said, we stick with students or our doors are never closed. That flexibility um, for access and for being uh, less punitive or finding ways to uh, still engage somebody after no shows or gaps in service are very important. Um, they uh, have a goal focus that helps young people stay engaged. As one person put, young adults want to go, go, go. So from day one, when we meet them, even before intake or orientation, we're asking them what their goals are because they really want to get going on them. Um, and if you're not moving with them, essentially, sometimes you lose their interest. Um, a lot of programs do very assertive outreach in the community. They are gentle. You um, uh, generally are not going to go out and uh, have success by being um, overly assertive for many of these young, young people, but they are proactive. Um, many felt that having a non-treatment environment was uh, important to engaging young adults, uh, that if it felt too uh, treatment-oriented, uh, that perhaps that was uh, dissuasive for their participation. And then uh, several of them had a strategy of having younger staff um, or people who can connect with youth cul culture easily and comfortably to be willing to engage with social media. And everybody has to have the ability to text. This notion of meeting young people where they're at was very important for um, engagement and, and success. Um, literally, the programs talked about service provision, uh, where they are, where young people are, in the community, at the mall, in their homes, at school, essentially going to them rather than having them come to you. Uh, as one person said, we've had people who were literally unwilling to come out of their room. In fact, we had one fellow who was literally in his closet and we did a series of home visits and we have communicated with people using sticky notes. You know, so we're about as flexible as we can be and this is all incredibly uh, important to being able to engage young people who um, at various times and at very, in various circumstances uh, can be very reticent to do so. There's also figuratively responding to um, their felt needs and goals at the time. So meeting where they're meeting them where they're at figuratively. Um, let's say you want more money. Uh, you want a car. You want a girlfriend. Then that's what we're all about. And we'll come in from the backside to say, uh, what kind of mental health issues get in the way of you getting a girlfriend or getting a job? And so using their goals uh, to help with their motivation, but then also providing an opportunity to examine when perhaps uh, addressing their mental health uh, symptoms or needs would help them achieve their goals. Um, and also being able to vary the intensity of services according to the need at that time. And then doing whatever it takes seemed to be a key principle. Um, having complete sec service flexibility. For example, uh, one person said those that are in post-secondary school for staff will go to the schools with them. They'll brief with them before or after. There's some young people that they might text with them in the morning to make sure they're up and ready to go and all kinds of things. Um, so to have tremendous sex flexibility in one's service can really help with uh, keeping young people um, working towards their goals. Uh, also providing direct assistance seemed to be a key strategy. One coach took his student to a bookstore and instructed him on what kinds of school supplies to buy to get a notebook organized for all of his classes. It was that basic and sad. We go all the way to, I just want you to check in every once in a while uh, with me when I have a test or a paper, from walking with them to purchase a notebook to just having them check in. Um, seems to be very important as a strategy. So that is a summary of the uh, many innovative practices that current services are um, undergoing or embracing to try to do their work as effectively as possible. Um, there are currently models that are being developed and research that are important to understand. Um, the individual placement and support for early intervention with young people who, have, who are in early stages of psychosis um, has been uh, implemented. 
Uh, there are a couple different versions of it, but Keith Nuchterlein and his colleagues at UCLA um, have published uh, a description of their approach, and our understanding is that uh, they will have very encouraging findings for both employment and educational outcomes that should be coming out in this fall um, from a, a good rigorous study. Uh, the Better Futures uh, approach, which was developed by Sarah Geenan and her colleagues at Portland State University, um, that you can find a description of uh, the uh, first manuscript describing their uh, program and their outcomes uh, at this website here, um, is also developed to help um, students uh, who have exited foster care to succeed in post-secondary education and training. Um, we at the Transitions RTC are also just initiating a Peer Academic Supports for Success, the PASS program, to, which is a uh, older students uh, coaching younger students who have a serious mental health condition to, for um, helping them to have better academic success. Uh, and that is just getting underway. Um, there is a model of supported employment and supported education combined that is based on the individual placement and support model that Marsha Ellison and her colleagues from our Transitions RTC recently published. Uh, that was in the special uh, issue that Sarah Geenan's paper was published in. Uh, many of these papers are accessible through the Pathways RRTC website. Um, the individual placement and support for high school age youth is uh, a program that will be developed to help uh, students who are still in high school who have a serious mental health condition to both help them with completing high school as well as starting some part-time employment to uh, get some of that success under their belt and with the initial years after high school which may be helping them to um, maintain jobs while they're pursuing some post-secondary uh, education or training. Um, we have also developed an adaptation of multisystemic ther therapy for emerging adults who have recently been involved with the justice system, who also have a serious mental health condition that has some preliminary evidence of uh, success in helping them to pursue either education or employment goals, um, as well as helping to keep them um, from getting in trouble with the law uh, in the future. Uh, Michelle uh, Mullins' uh, research that we described earlier as the environmental scan that Marsha Ellison and she and colleagues looked at innovative programs is resulting in a program called HYPE, Helping Youth on the Path to Employment, that will be um, developing a very specific approach to helping young people uh, both pursue their uh, education goals while uh, many of them will also be pursuing employment. Um, but focusing on education and training goals. Uh, Project Renew, uh, for which Joanne Malloy is the PI, has some preliminary evidence of, of being effective in helping young people both complete high school as well as uh, have college success, uh, and that has recently received uh, grant funding from the Institute of Educational Services, Sciences, uh, the IES grant, um, and they, will, they are just getting underway with a randomized controlled trial to look at that more rigorously. Achieve My Plan, which you can see uh, described with these two links, developed by Janet Walker and her colleagues at the Pathways Rehabilitation Research and Training Center, is a, uh, a self-determination focused uh, co care coordination model uh, to help young people uh, identify their plans, uh, many of which include employment uh, and education goals. The Cornerstone Program, which is a boundary spanning case management and peer support model for transition age youth that is being developed by Michelle Munson uh, with uh, funding from the National Institute of Mental Health, um, is currently uh, undergoing its initial stages of research. Um, and those are the programs that are being developed that we hope to see have uh, great evidence of efficacy in the near future and uh, uh, greater supports for the many and increasing young people who are pursuing post-secondary education and training who have a serious mental health condition. Thank you.